Uh, okay, so uh, I'm very uh, glad to introduce um, uh, uh, Marco Di Renzo, uh, who is uh, with uh, CNRS in uh, Central Supelec. Uh, so uh, Marco uh, is a specialist of uh, communication uh, and mostly uh, interested in, in, uh, in cellular uh, networking. Uh, he's well known for uh, his beautiful contributions to uh, uh, spatial modulation, uh, which uh, uh, is a very interesting uh, uh, <clears throat> new concept uh, pertaining to MIMO, uh, massive MIMO particularly, and which is very important nowadays. Uh, he was also uh, very active in various machine learning um, uh, aspects uh, in connection with uh, optimi optimization of uh, communication networks. Um, and uh, lately, uh, he got interested in what he will present today, uh, namely uh, uh, intelligent, uh, 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 reconfigurable uh, intelligent surfaces. Uh, where, uh, so he is involved in uh, uh, several European projects on this uh, beautiful topic, uh, which uh, some of which started uh, lately. Uh, so uh, he's. Um, interested in, 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 in various topics ranging from information theory to stochastic geometry to very concrete uh, aspects of communication uh, uh, pertaining, for instance, to uh, uh, the first topic, I mean, um, which I, I described. He's uh, extremely uh, successful. Uh, he has sort of a best award uh, uh, um, uh, paper almost every year. And I'm very glad he accepted our invitation to give a lecture on the topic, which is uh, the most important, uh, if I understand to him nowadays, namely uh, intelligent surfaces. Marco, I forgot lots of things, so please feel free to ask. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Francois, for the uh, invitation, I mean, to, to you and all your colleagues, I mean, from Lynx, and uh, also for the very nice um, introduction. So yes, it's it's correct. Basically, at the for the time being, my main <coughs> research topic is this RIS, so uh, smart surfaces. And so I started a couple of years ago, and uh, now I mean today I will try to give you um, an introduction first. I mean to this topic uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, and then I mean I will try possibly to report some new uh, results from an approach that we have been developing, uh, working a little bit on the um, you know, a crossroad between wireless and um, electromagnetic. So now I'm very much interested in this um, interplay. So uh, basically there will be two parts in this, uh, in this uh, um, talk. First, the general things about um, RIS and then a little bit more concrete things on the um, communication models for, for, uh, for RIS. Uh, try a little bit to bridge this gap of knowledge between uh, electromagnetics and wireless, uh, wireless applications. So I have many slides, so I will not be able really to present all of them, but I, I will stop, I mean, uh, at three. <laughs> so and then, I mean, if there is uh, questions, I would be very glad, I mean, to take them. Okay, so uh, I guess that you know where Central Superlake is, so I skip uh, that. Uh, just, I mean, uh, um, a couple of um, words about some materials that you may be interested in uh, related to this, to this presentation. So I, um, uh, I have quite a few videos on a course that actually I was asked to uh, organize at Uri University uh, last, at the end of last year. So it's 12 hours, so hopefully we'll be able to do it also in now. Uh, Central Superlake next year. And, uh, and then, I mean, uh, uh, if you are interested on, on a more general, uh, longer, I would say, presentation on uh, what these RIS are and what you can do with them, maybe you can also have a look at this, uh, at this video. Uh, if you check the programs of many conferences uh, that uh, we are going to have in 2021, you will see that there are many sessions, panels, and, uh, and tutorials, and um, where actually we will be also giving some presentations with some other colleagues. So. I mean, you may, you may want to check uh, in case, I mean, you are interested uh, for uh, longer, I mean, presentations and more detailed presentation, I would say. So um, I'll give you one reference <clears throat> as a starting point. If, I mean, you want to know a little bit what this topic is all, is all about, this it was written with a few colleagues uh, across multiple disciplines. Uh, including also electromagnetics and uh, and um, and uh, metamaterials. So now I'm collaborating quite a, a bit with uh, 
Sergei Tetriakov from Alto University and uh, the uh, Julien Delemy, who is part of the group of uh, Matthias Fink and Geoffroy Le Rosé at uh, Institut Langevin. So let's start with a general uh, introduction about this topic. <clears throat> so I start with an example that we published some time, some time ago to give you uh, the concept of uh, programmable environments and then some uh, pros and cons of this technology, this technique, this approach. So um, that's a, a very relatively <clears throat> simple uh, networks, uh, network. So we are going to have a couple of base stations, one mobile terminal, and uh, the typical approach in this cellular network is that uh, in theory, in this simple setting, uh, you are going to be served by base station number uh, one. So the mobile terminal M is going to be served by base station number one because it gives you the best signal in this setting. But um, things might be a little bit more complex, like in this case, where you have an obstacle in between uh, your uh, theoretically best, I mean, base stations and, and the mobile terminal. So uh, when you are going to be associated to another base station here, you may be uh, get service from BS2. So one take is that uh, the complexity of the environment basically introduces some attenuations on your intended link, for, for example, which uh, uh, obliges you to use another, another base station. Um, this is not necessarily the worst things that can happen because uh, you may also have some uh, objects that uh, may introduce reflections. So these reflections, I mean, for example, this can be a large metal object. Uh, you, you may get a reflection according to the <laughs> Nello of, of reflection. So, and this might be a sort of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, security threads for, for you because this user may uh, overhear your, your signal. So uh, objects might block your signal, objects might reflect uh, towards uh, undesired directions of your signal, opening the network to interference, uh, to, to security problems. Uh, along the same lines, objects might, this might be a window, for example, so you may have some signal that goes through uh, is transmitted that you may create interference somewhere. So there's quite a bit of complexity in how the waves uh, are inter interact with the objects, with the environment. And the bottom line is that uh, you can control what happens at the base stations, you can control what it happens at the mobile terminal, but once the waves leaves the base stations, they interact with the objects. Uh, and uh, as of today, we do not control what happens. We just adapt to this, to this, to them. And I will clarify this later on. So the, the bottom line is that as of today, we don't really control the, the, radio, <clears throat> the radio waves when they impinge upon this, uh, this, these objects. So uh, we can call this uh, dumb or not smart, uh, meaning that uh, um, you can process the signals at the base station, you can process signals in the mobile terminal, but you cannot process the signals at the, at the, at the object. So, so now there is no intelligence at the object. So, what we saw in this very simple example is the following. So the environment itself doesn't really play in our favor. Uh, we tried to capitalize on the uh, statistical properties of the environment. For example, to, we deployed MIMOS and then we tried to exploit the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, richness of the want of the scattering environment to increase the, the rate. Uh, but this has always been done at the transmitter and the receiver, optimizing transmitter and the receiver. On the other end, uh, we have never manipulated the, the uh, operations of the object. So we def therefore uh, adapted to, to it. Now we want to change a little bit the, the, the behavior, uh, the, 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 the approach in a way that we don't accept to adapt, but we would like to control the, the environment or to program if you want the, the, uh, the environment. So the concept is not very, very much dissimilar from the concept of SDN or software defined networking, uh, but here we are operating at a different layer if you, if you like. So the, <clears throat> the bottom line would be, uh, the question would be, uh, can we uh, realize something of this kind? So can we change the response to the electromagnetic wave uh, of these objects in a way that uh, depending on when the user is, we can always turn this reflection and this transmission, this refraction into uh, something useful for the mobile terminal. In this case, we may exploit a sort of macro diversity that allows us to combine all the signals together such that we get the, good sig the, um, the signal from base station, so we, we, we connect to base station one, but we can exploit these transmissions and these, these reflections and so on. And this is what we, is called at least today now, uh, smart wireless or programmable, uh, smart radio environments or programmable radio, radio environments. So the, the question mark is uh, how do we make this, uh, this possible? And then uh, what kind of benefits we can have uh, uh, if this is uh, this possible from the quantitative point of view? 
one of the key concepts is that uh, besides being smart, so besides these objects being smart, they also need to be reconfigurable. So reconfigurable in the sense that if uh, the, for example, here, this device dropper uh, understand uh, that uh, we are uh, modifying the operation of this object, he may move or he may do something that allows him to detect this uh, uh, anomalous reflection, this modified reflection. So in this case, we may need to change the operation of this object. So it's not important that we are able to program, but we important also that we are able to reprogram uh, the objects uh, on, a, on a relatively, uh, on a given coherence time. The same applies whether it's the mobile terminal that moves and therefore we need to track the uh, his, his position uh, through uh, modifying the, the operation of the object. So to, to give you a simple example, if we just focus on the, uh, on the example of reflections, which is uh, uh, normal objects adhere to Snello, which implies that the angle in, in green here is the same as the angle in, in red. We cannot really change this, which implies that for this receiver, this signal is not useful. It may be uh, introduced interference, it may break the interface. Uh, we would like to uh, deploy a technology on these objects that allows us to make it smart. Smart means to cancel completely the specular reflection, which we will get according to the law of physics, and to create a reflection which somehow we break the law of physics because we modify the electromagnetic properties of these objects. And this is basically what can be called the generalized Snell law or generalized law of uh, reflections more, uh, more properly. Of course, I mean, this is a very ideal uh, setup because uh, as we will see, there are electronic circuits that allow us to do that. We see what it's all about. But uh, in practice, what we can actually have is to uh, modify the response of the objects in a way that we can mainly steer the beams uh, or the, the signals towards the intended directions, but there will be always uh, parasitic uh, issues, I mean, related to, to that, which in some cases might not be completely uh, ignored. That's basically the main, the main, the main uh, idea. So the technology to make this true uh, is called, uh, it has many names. Um, and uh, and uh, one of those is actually reconfigurable intelligent surfaces where um, these three terms for me at least means that uh, we have surfaces, then uh, I will show you a picture. They are intelligent, where intelligent means smart, which means that uh, they are not regular walls, but they are walls that uh, can actually do something different than regular walls. Uh, so like anomalous reflections, the generalized Nello. And reconfigurable means that uh, you cannot uh, build your surface by steering the beams once forever for the rest of your life, but you need to change what is gonna happen uh, over time, depending on the status of the network. That's basically the reason why I tend to call them uh, in that way. Um, so the, uh, basically you can think of, um, you can think of um, uh, a, this RIS has a, a very thin sheet of electromagnetic material. So it's a, it's, a, it's a poster, a typical poster that basically we can use in, uh, we're used to use at, at conferences if you want. So uh, very, very thin, uh, but uh, electrically large in the, uh, you know, um, X and Y directions, but very uh, thin in the, in, the Z, uh, in the Z direction. So the idea is that um, if you look at the structure is that you have a surface where there are many tiny elements that you can think of like tiny antenna elements uh, for simplicity, uh, which are called unit cells. So depending on how you um, build these unit cells, which is like the size, uh, the shape, et cetera, the, uh, the response of the uh, surface changes. So you basically, you can change the, the direction of reflection. Um, in order to make it reconfigurable, you need to have some uh, electric, electronic circuits that here are shown as tunable elements for, uh, for general, uh, just for, for the sake of generality. But they can be pin diodes. And depending on how you set this matrix of pin diodes, you are gonna get, uh, you're gonna change your directions of, uh, of reflections. Uh, one of the things that is important here is that you will not find any power amplifiers, any analog to digital converter, digital to analog converters, RF cables and whatever. So in theory, this occurs, all the transformations that I showed you occurs at the, um, at the electromagnetic level. So what people now call uh, layer zero, uh, 
because really there is no digital uh, operations uh, at all. Of course, you need to, uh, if you need to change over time the status of these uh, tunable elements, you need at least to, to have a very simple uh, interface with the, uh, with the network that basically allows you to change uh, these tunable elements over, uh, over time with a given, a given speed, if you want. So that's the kind of structure that we have. Then we see what people uh, in communications do and what the limitations of the models that exist uh, are as of today. So very quickly, uh, what you can do with these surfaces. So the current vision says that uh, in theory you can deploy anywhere. Okay. And, uh, and through these uh, surfaces, uh, you may be able to steer the beams uh, throughout the entire cities or uh, indoors. And this basically allows you to get a better, a better coverage, a better rate without really creating new waves. That's basically the main, the main idea. So the possibility of implementing everything at the uh, physical layer without uh, digital signal processing, without power, uh, power amplifications. Of course, there are more, uh, there are scenarios that are, uh, makes more sense than others because uh, if you need to adapt the status of the uh, surface every time that the uh, user moves, uh, this takes time uh, and then to estimate the network status. And so uh, in a very dynamic environment, this can be uh, complex, at least in a, to be done in an optimal sense. Uh, this is one of the typical examples that um, I show you because then I will show you some experimental activities and prototypes just to give you a concrete taste of what exists. So here, for example, you may have a, a typical access point uh, that may not be located in a good way to provide a good service to these users over here because of the, 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 the steep angle. Uh, but what you may do is to deploy these surfaces so to, 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 to create actually windows that are made of these uh, uh, smart materials. And then through optimizing the response of these windows, you may be able to get a good, a good coverage here. And that's nice because it's, not, it's aesthetically nice. And so it seems to be a, a, good, a good solution, a good approach at least. Um, overall, I mean, uh, this was one slide that, that was made by my colleagues in, in Orange Labs. And you can see that in theory, you could really scale up this and uh, deploy these large surfaces almost everywhere. And then, I mean, try to uh, make sure that uh, the, 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 their operation is coordinated through uh, some entity that allows you to reprogram and to optimize the behavior of the, of the network. So you may increase the, uh, the signal quality in some areas. You may cancel out the interference in some other areas. You may increase the security or maybe lower the electromagnetic radiation when actually it's needed. So, uh, and so the division is that you take an environment, you attach the surfaces, and then basically you try to optimize them for multiple uh, objectives, as basically I told you. Uh, most of the research activities now are on how to develop models for these surfaces how to integrate them into networks, and then how to compute, estimate all these performance metrics, and then optimize the surfaces uh, accordingly, and also try to understand the, um, the uh, trade-offs and I mean, the, the Pareto regions so by taking into account all these performance metrics, okay? So as I said, uh, the typical operations that people are looking at at the moment are uh, scenario one, which is enhancing the signal quality through uh, sort of uh, smart relays, uh, reducing the interference, which is somehow uh, scenario number two, where you use uh, in this specific case, the surface not to enhance your signal, but to cancel the interference that comes from this, uh, from this link here. Scenario number three is already told is the enhancing the security. And scenario number four is when you have a multiple antennas here, multiple antennas here, your channel might be uh, not rich in terms of scattering. So you may not capitalize on the presence of many antennas, but you may create artificial scattering uh, through the, the, the RIS. Other applications now are also uh, reducing the electromagnetic radiations, for example. So, um, just to conclude this introduction, I give you just an example to show you what the pros and cons of this technology might be. Only one, I mean, uh, I have many other examples, but um, just I want to discuss more the, the second part. Um, we could, for example, try to understand what the pros and cons are uh, between an RIS and a relay, because uh, based on the examples that I gave to you, a relay might be maybe the closest or, or one of the most similar technology 
to, 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 to an RIS. And the comparison is not simple, but from, a, let's say, from a qualitative point of view, we could maybe say that the text that is available here in, 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 in black, which of course, I mean, uh, in, a, in, in a relay, what we have uh, is for sure uh, power amplifications. We have, uh, most of the time we have decoding. Uh, in, we get the signal, so we go back to the uh, digital domain and then we re-encode and then we retransmit with power amplifications. Uh, because of these uh, um, DSP operations, uh, we usually add the noise. So there is a usually a noise amplification, especially if you operate in amplifying forward uh, relaying. Uh, we don't use the power amplifiers. That's one of the main benefits of this uh, of this technology. So there are no active elements uh, a priori. Um, if we look at this RIS as a sort of a full duplex uh, uh, relay, because we can receive and transmit at the same time, because uh, we don't decode the signals basically here. Um, we could view an RIS as a sort of transparent full duplex relay. Uh, that could be a, a simple way of defining it, but for sure it's much simpler than a conventional full duplex relay because we don't, there is not even interference cancellation, of course. From a quantitative point of view, this might be viewed as the downside as a first, uh, as a first, uh, at the first sight. Uh, if we go to the rate, uh, plotted rate of this uh, of a system that is aided by uh, an RIS in the setup that I showed you earlier, transmitter RIS destination. And this is the distance between the uh, transmitter, the RIS, and the, and the destination. You need to compare two lines. One is the black and one is the uh, green line. And the black line is the RIS case and the green line is the uh, green case. Uh, yeah, sorry, it's the full duplex relay case. Uh, you can see that here I, I've chosen this setup in a way that these two lines were closely overlapping by saying that an RIS gives you almost the same performance as, as a relay. Uh, the benefits are that you do that uh, with no decoding, no power amplifications, no noise amplifications, no interference cancellation, because this is a full duplex relay here. But the downside is that you need a surface of 1.5 square, uh, 1.5 meter, the, the diagonal in order to achieve the same uh, rate here as one antenna uh, relay. So basically the, 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 the sort of no free lunch rule in the sense that uh, you, can you can get all these benefits, but you pay this with the size of, this, of, the, of the surface. So you need to have a relatively large surface, even though one square meter or even more is not that big, at least uh, at, the, at the moment. Because uh, there are some prototypes, uh, this one of those I will show you other side, uh, I have some other slides later on, but that's one one prototype uh, implemented at the MIT uh, last year, um, where basically you have a surface of a six square meter, so it's relatively large, with approximately four thousand uh, tiny uh, unit cells, so the scattering elements that actually you can tune in order to um, optimize basically the behavior of the environment. So um, you do need to have a, a relatively large size, but people are going towards this direction. So from the information, to, uh, from the communication theoretic point of view, the, 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 the interest uh, in, in playing with this RIS comes from the fact that so far, okay, so far we basically um, have been playing with the uh, transmitter and the receiver, optimizing, uh, and we have optimized them jointly, uh, while assuming uh, the, um, basically, transition probabilities here are fixed in this conventional uh, IT model. Here, um, with the RIS, uh, the RIS basically allows us not to keep this fixed anymore, but basically you can also play with the transition probabilities. So the transition probabilities can be optimized. And so you have two optimization loops, the outer loop, which is the conventional one, plus the inner loop. In theory, you could also replace and remove completely the outer loop and just play with the inner loop. In addition, you may also um, uh, not only uh, optimize the response, but also to encode the information onto the, uh, onto the uh, different states that the different uh, unit cells can take. Okay, so this allows you also to increase the, the rate. And if, indeed, I mean, in a couple of papers uh, with some colleagues in the information theory community, 
uh, I'm not going to tackle this today, we, we showed that uh, encoding information also on 2D RIS uh, is basically capacity achieving. So if you don't exploit this, this part here, it's not, uh, it's not basically capacity achieving. So we are not exploiting the RIS in the best possible way. Of course, this is more complex because you need to be able to modulate the, the states of the RIS much quickly. So it's uh, this poses some, some challenges from the practical point of view, but theoretically you can get quite some gains. So that's a little bit uh, more of the introduction for, for those of you who are not familiar with this, uh, with this technology. Uh, as I said, I didn't give you the entire picture, but um, hopefully I mean this give you the, uh, at least the, the basic understanding of, uh, uh, what basically this RIS allows us to do. So surfaces that we can deploy in, uh, on the objects and uh, we can optimize their, their operations. The question mark is how to model the operation of this RIS in a realistic, uh, in a realistic way, such that we can um, take into account their actual behavior without oversimplifying it. And I will try to tackle this at least to the best of my understanding because it's, a, it's not a very mature topic uh, in this, this second, uh, second part. And I will show you some of the uh, recent paper, recent results that we, that we obtained. So um, let's start with what exists. What is the state of the art? Uh, so first of all, the typical view of this RIS, uh, when you, we, I mean, if you open, now, I mean, I'm reading more papers in, uh, I mean, in, uh, transaction antennas and propagations and nature science and uh, I don't know, physics letters, then, then in communication. But, uh, so if you open these two, two different classes of papers, uh, you, you, really, you really see that an RIS um, means something completely different. Um, in the communication uh, field, an RIS is viewed uh, as, a, as a rectangle. <laughs> that is made of tiny, tiny elements, basically tiny rectangles here in, in blue. And uh, um, each uh, of these basically tiny elements can be modified as you want. So the response of it can be modified as you want. More precisely, generally speaking, what you want to do is to have a, an electromagnetic field that comes in, and then you wanna have an electromagnetic field that goes out with the characteristics that you, that you want. So the, the one that is scattered, ES, HS, uh, and this is usually a function of the incident field and the, how you optimize the surface. So the scatter of the field also depends on the incident field. So this is not completely and completely basically independent. What you, um, one of the easiest way to, to I mean, first of all, <clears throat> there are a different, uh, given this structure here, the structure here, people then view this, uh, this RIS in at least three possible ways, which are the following. One is, uh, you split the RIS into elements, these unit cells that I, that I showed you, in a way that uh, they are spaced uh, lambda over two, so that uh, you have uh, a conventional system like a reflect array. Uh, and this is the easiest way, I mean, to model it, but does not really correspond to very advanced uh, designs and there are some limitations. Another approach is to view uh, an RIS as a continuum I will give you a figure about, about that. So not made of this, it's made physically of discrete element, but you model it as a, as a continuum, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, an infinite number of points, basically. And then there is an intermediate uh, view, uh, which I'm gonna describe to you more today, uh, even though we have results more in everything, where you, you still keep the discrete structure of the, of the elements, but these elements can be much closer than lambda over two, in order to uh, pack more elements in, in a given space, but also uh, because it allows you to implement transformations that otherwise you may not be able to implement. Uh, but then you have a coupling, so the elements interact. And so we want to take into account this coupling in the optimization uh, process and also in the, in, the, in the modeling. So if you want to visualize what I just said, you may uh, have these three different uh, say conceptual uh, representations of an RIS. We have a surface which is uh, not very dense, is made of elements that are uh, spaced lambda over, uh, over two. You have uh, uh, elements that are uh, more densely deployed, so you cannot ignore anymore the interactions between them, or you can just say, okay, this is just a continuum, 
and, and let's see what is going to happen. So here you can simplify the mirror coupling. Here there are tools that you can uh, apply, mathematical tools that allow you to do to say something. This is a little bit uh, in the in the middle, and it's uh, uh, basically is what to, I'm trying basically to study today. And then I will comment on the CMS continuously the surface at the very end. I mean because we are also working on that. So uh, just to give you a concrete taste of why there are three these these three different definitions is because these are some of the prototypes that exist so far as today. So that's, uh, I've already told you, but you can see here some examples. I just put the emphasis on, on two of them. This here, you can see a very scattered, you know, uh, really discrete elements that are, that are deployed. And then I would like to, 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 to bring your attention to this one, uh, which is actually a window. So you don't really see the elements because they are so close to the space that you don't really see. This is transparent, this is a meta surface, completely transparent. Uh, you can change the, uh, how the waves are reflected and how the waves are refracted. Not electronically at the moment, you need to move the, uh, I mean, mechanically the, 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 the wheel at the moment. But actually this, uh, this uh, you can see that it's actually transparent. And this, um, uh, if you think of the figure that I told you about these big uh, buildings, I mean, this, you might, you might imagine how you can, you can use this. That's just to allow you to visualize this and also the reason why there are different models. Uh, we are also doing something uh, in uh, in uh, in Central Subalec in collaboration with Orange Labs, but uh, I'm not going to report this to you today. I mean, just to say that we do have uh, an RIS as well, and uh, we have some students uh, in my, my group and jointly with with Orange Labs and try to do some so, some experiments in case you are interested in uh, in discussing these uh, these issues. So going back to the the mat, um, as I said here, we take this model that we have a surface and then we specialize it. We have a discrete elements. We assume that each element, as you can see here, can be controlled through uh, some electronic circuits, which is a tunable impedance. And we assume that we can do this independently, elements by elements, but the elements are sufficiently close that we cannot ignore the uh, neutral coupling. That's what we would like to do. Let's see what exists. What exists is that the people most of the time just consider that each element here, that is here uh, represented by this, is viewed as a sort of ideal phase shifter. So you don't, uh, you just face, uh, you just change the phase of the incoming uh, wave and you get a wave out that is just phase shifted. Uh, and the objective here, many people do, is just they want to optimize all these phases such that you align all the contributions that are scattered from the, each of the elements such that they are aligned and so you maximize the envelope of the received signal, you maximize the received uh, power, okay? You can see here that you co-phase completely and you cancel the phases of all of them. More concretely, people look at the problem in this way. They say, I have a, a, a channel here, HN, which is the channel that goes from the base station to this element here, HN. Then you have GN, which is the channel that goes from this element here to here. And then you have uh, each element of the, um, um, the RIS is viewed as a complex number, but you can tune as you want. It's a very simple setup. Uh, here I'm showing you very simple things today just to highlight the, uh, the fundamental challenges in modeling. But um, if you start adding MIMOs here, MIMOs here, if you start adding interference, other links, it's getting much more complex. Uh, then I will give you an example later on. But let's keep things simple for the moment. So this gamma is a complex number. And then the most used model is the following. They say gamma is a complex number, amplitude, phase. Uh, and, and many people assume, let's assume that, let's consider that AN is independent of the phase. So you, you can uh, ideally tune independently the amplitude and the phase of the reflection coefficient. If this is the case in this very simple setting, you can rewrite your simple uh, SNR expression in this case, and the optimization problems boils down into how to maximize the SNR uh, by optimizing the phase shift phi n of each, of each element. For this spe special case, there is a, a, a simple solution, which just tells us that uh, you just need to, as I said, co-phase all the, all the elements. 
So the phase, uh, the optimal phase of this uh, phase shifter is just basically nulling the sum of the phases introduced by the uh, channel, uh, cascaded channel. That's basically the symbol K. And, uh, but this holds only if the amplitude is independent of the, of the phase. So 90-90% of papers available in wireless communications have these assumptions. And this is because it's relatively simple, even though when you map it in the physical system, it's not that simple at all, okay? in, in, uh, with interference, etc. So uh, you can have a, a slightly more um, complex model that I show you how things get complex then. Let's just change one thing. We say, okay, uh, it's not really physically possible, for example, to, 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 to change the amplitude independently of the phase. So somehow the amplitude will depend on the phase. So if you assume that, uh, first of all, I mean, what uh, physical structure may allow you to do that? This is one of physical structure where uh, each element of the surface, it's modeled as an equivalent electronic uh, circuit. And you can make it reconfigurable. You can change uh, the amplitude. Yeah, so you can change the phase and then you can change also the amplitude by changing, for example, the capacity of this small circuit. Well, uh, in this case, people say, okay, this is the um, reflection coefficient that uh, you may get in this, in this case. So this gamma n actually depends on Zn, which implies that if I change Cn, I change Zn and I change gamma n. But now, since the amplitude and the phase of gamma n depend both on Cn, they are not independent, independent of each other. So you can actually derive a relation of this kind if you write some, some map. Uh, this actually, uh, what is the meaning of this, uh, just understand the, the challenges. So what is the meaning of this reflection coefficient uh, if you really want to, to use it for, for wireless communication? So this coefficient is obtained in, uh, in, in metamaterials for, for the people who actually build then the surfaces in this way. You take, for, for example, let's assume only that each element can only occupy two states, which implies that uh, yeah, what, what people call the binary unit cells. So you can only, for example, have a phase zero and a phase 180 degrees, okay? Just for simplicity. Uh, this reflection coefficient means that you need to create an infinite uh, structure where each element uh, is the same and is configured with a given CN that corresponds to this reflection coefficient. And then you actually consider an infinite surface. And then when you consider this infinite surface, you get this reflection coefficient. Uh, the other uh, um, uh, reflection coefficient is obtained by setting the capacity to a different value and then consider an infinite surface, okay? But then you compute this gamma one, gamma two, and then you pretend to use them when you configure the surface in this way. You understand that uh, um, even though you are using gamma one and gamma two, this setup, is not the same as the previous one that I told you where you define gamma one and gamma two. First of all, the surface is not infinite, it's finite, and it's not uh, homogeneous. There is no periodicity, it's not completely periodic. So this gamma one and gamma two do not exactly basically represent the coupling, the actual coupling that exists when you optimize and when you tune each individual element at the operation time. In any case, this technique is widely used in the field of metamaterials. And um, I'm actually studying this quite a lot and I'm trying to really work with people who are building metamaterials in order to understand more the implications when we use it in a practical system and uh, developing models for, for, for them. I will show you some examples. Uh, but we also, uh, thanks to the help of some colleagues in, in, in China mainly, uh, who have uh, these uh, surfaces. This was um, a trip, uh, during a trip that I, that I uh, in 2019, I mean, to, to China. We started discussing on how to validate some of these assumptions. And in the end, I mean, this resulted in a couple of papers where we uh, used some real surfaces here. And we try to check basically uh, structures that uh, compute this reflection coefficient by assuming this periodic boundary condition that I told you, when the surface is actually uh, infinitely long. And we try to see what it happens when we configure them and then we measure the, the signals. And um, for the setups, at least that we considered, they are uh, working quite, quite well. But 
it depends really on the kind of operations that you that you implement okay so here the main the main one of the problem is that the definition of replacement coefficient is not exactly the same when the surface operates okay but it's more realistic than the previous model that i that i described where the amplitude is uh, independent uh, can be independently optimized uh, regardless of the phase it's more accurate. There are some assumptions from the physics point of view, from the electromagnetic point of view, uh, what is gonna happen when we plug it into an optimization framework for communications? Well, if just we assume that this is generic, we don't really care what this function is. You know? We just say, okay, it's a function. Let's plug it into our simple system model for a sim 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 single, single, in single input, single output system. Then here the objective is uh, always maximize the SNR as a function of phi n, but now phi n also controls this. Well, it turns out that the solution to this very simple problem is not available in closed form, at least to the best of my knowledge. Um, it actually depends on what exact function you have, and in general, is not the same as the optimal solution that you found under the assumptions that this is not independent of phi n. The reason is that you may get some phases for which the amplitude is equal to zero, which implies that uh, you are not getting the, the energy from that, uh, from that element. So in general, to the best of my knowledge, uh, this is an approach uh, that is uh, used often uh, to design meta surfaces in meta materials. There are some assumptions, and in a but when you plug it into an optimization framework, you may get stuck uh, even in simple scenarios. And in fact, here could have developed some numerical solutions, uh, not even optimal to, to get this. So you can see that uh, the message is a very minor modification, which is just assuming that the amplitude depends on the phase, is not independent of the phase, uh, brings you uh, quite uh, some complexity when you plug it, even in a very simple uh, communication model. So it's really a problem in, in um, you know, uh, an open problem, uh, identifying uh, accurate models for the RIS that then can be used for optimization in wireless communications. So if we wanna summarize what I told you before I, I give you some uh, new results, and uh, honestly, I mean, also to get the, this picture, it got quite uh, a bit during the last year, but uh, the, if we consider the first model, uh, where it's uh, the ideal one, uh, we say that the process that uh, it's relatively simple uh, to be used in communication, and see, at least in some canonical cases. The cons is that uh, it's considered to be not realistic by people working in meta materials. But I mean, it allows us to understand quite a few things. Um, the second one is very well established in meta materials to design the meta, the meta surfaces. But uh, when it comes to uh, writing a communication model, uh, it's quite complex. Uh, often, I mean, everything is embedded because most of the time these reflection coefficients are obtained through uh, full wave simulations, through some electromagnetic simulations. And also the accuracy is a question mark because the reflection coefficient is defined in a setting that is not exactly uh, the one uh, of the, uh, uh, when basically the, 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 the surface operates. That's basically the, to the best of my understanding where we are where we are now uh, it's not really to judge the different models they have a pros and cons it's just i mean that's my best understanding of what exists uh, today uh, in this uh, in this field so we try to um, somehow develop uh, try to develop a model that somehow could uh, always under some assumptions allows us to overcome some of these limitations so um, i have 10 minutes, so I will try to give you the, the main elements. <clears throat> but the idea is that uh, we start from this simple model, uh, from this uh, uh, relatively simple model, where we have a transmitter in blue. The, we start from a very physical structure and then we write the, the math. But um, the physical structure is uh, uh, a transmitter where we have um, uh, uh, antenna elements that in this case are dipoles. The reason why we consider dipoles is because we can do some math, at least as a preliminary study, even though it will not result in, a, in an actual surface when you plug it into an RIS, but uh, at least I mean it's a starting point. Uh, each element of the transmitter is controlled by a voltage generator, so it's actually a transmitter. The receiver is a, a, a similar structure uh, where you have dipoles, but you, you connect everything to loads that mimic um, 
an electronic circuit that is connected to the load to the, to the antenna receiving antenna. And the RIS is a, a bunch of uh, collections of dipoles, these times uh, closed, connected to a tunable impedance, similar to the principle that I gave you before. So this you can uh, tune and optimize this ZSS, ZSMN. And so the optimization problem is uh, how can I optimize all this Z in, in the RIS such that I can optimize my performance metric? Uh, by taking into account that these elements can be very close to each other. So the objective, the first point is how can we develop uh, an equivalent channel that allows us to link uh, the voltages that we measure here with the voltages that we measure here. Okay, that's the contribution that I will show you. And also uh, we will do that by uh, considering four main characteristics. Uh, first of all, we want to have that the model is end-to-end, -end, so we really want to more get the expression of the voltages from which then you can get the power, etc., from at the receiver as a function of the, the uh, transmitted signal here. We would like to depart from Maxwell equations. Uh, we want to take into account the mutual coupling, as I said, and implicitly we want to take into account the actual circuits that is available here during the actual operation time, not assuming these uh, 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 infinite boundary conditions if you, if you want that I described to you before. So now, long story short, I'm not going to give you the, the proof, but we started from Maxwell equations. We wrote the electric field for the dipoles, and then we computed the receiver the power going through the, the RIS. And the results that we get is this one. So this is the, I'm not going to tell you everything in this formula, but basically we have a matrix, uh, typical, uh, similar to a MIMO channel matrix. So Y is equal to H times X, that links input and output together. And in this matrix, you have everything. You have the, the, uh, the uh, impedance of the generator, you have the structure of the antenna, the transmitter, the load at the receiver, the structure of the receiver antennas, the tunable elements, and the structure of the dipoles at the, at the RIS, okay? So the, the things that I want to highlight is that uh, you can clearly distinguish, if we go into the details of this formula, two things. The coupling, the coupling uh, so of the, of the elements of the RIS. This matrix uh, is in general not diagonal because of the coupling. If there is no coupling, uh, so there is no interaction between the elements, even though they are very close to each other, this is going to be diagonal, otherwise it's not diagonal. And this is the, um, those impedances that I told you that I can tune at the RIS. So you can optimize this. So now, long story short, uh, we did some analysis to, to check whether uh, this model could be consistent. And if, for example, you consider a simple case study where you have a single antenna de transmitter and a single antenna de receiver, and uh, the, the transmitter and the RIS are far from each other, and the RIS and the receiver are far from each other, but you take into account the mutual coupling in the RIS, you get something that is simpler. And uh, you can clearly recognize uh, the channel from the transmitter to the surface, the channel from the surface to the receiver, and then a term that determines the mutual coupling here and the tunability, which is what actually you wanted to, to have. So now the next step is uh, um, to optimize this how to use this for optimization in a system. So how to really identify the optimal impedances such that, for example, you maximize the received signal to noise ratio. So I briefly give you the, the, the results here and then, and then I close. So uh, the first case study that we consider is that you have uh, one transmitter and one receiver. Here uh, you can assume one antenna here, one antenna here, but this is generic many, many elements uh, here. And this is uh, the RIS that is attached to the to a wall, for example. So, well, we uh, formulated an optimization problem. Uh, this is simple because we wanted to obtain previous cases, previous uh, case studies, where you maximize the received power, which is the one that is uh, here, the absolute value, as a function of the matrix of impedances that you have uh, at your RIS, under the assumption that you don't amplify the signal, so the real part of the impedances is greater than zero, uh, but you can change uh, the imaginary part as you want as an ideal uh, setting. 
So long story short, we managed to, uh, in the absence of coupling, we managed to find a closed form solution. So we take the problem, we reformulate the problem in an equivalent way without losing anything. Uh, so this is exactly I mean, the same as, uh, as before. And, uh, and we are able to prove that in this case, the optimal solution is given by this. So this is different from the second case study that I told you, because in the second case study that I told you, for example, there was the dependence between the amplitude and the phase, but we were not able to compute the closed form expression of the optimization problem, the optimal, uh, the optimal phase shift. Here, we are actually able to compute the optimal values of the impedances uh, in the absence of neutral coupling. So, and we get performance trends similar to uh, those obtained in, uh, in, some other, in some other works uh, through other, other techniques. Uh, if we have mutual coupling, uh, we managed also to solve this case, which is, but not in closed form. Um, it's more challenging because this matrix uh, is, um, is not diagonal, which implies that you cannot compute this inversion uh, very easily. So in order to overcome this complexity, we applied an approximation. So we applied what is called the Newman series. So what we do is, uh, if you define G as this, uh, the sum of these elements, if you, if you want, we introduce a perturbation, which can be relatively small, and then we do a sort of Taylor expansion, which is this series. Now, in the paper, we report the conditions under which uh, the, uh, this expansion can be considered to be accurate. So you need to play on the absolute value of ZD, such as to make this uh, relatively accurate, okay? Uh, and in the end, I mean, we develop the algorithm, but um, let's keep this, uh, let me give you the results. <clears throat> we basically managed to show the following. I will show you two figures and then and then I close. We managed to do the following. We, uh, we, um, we consider the different setups. We consider an RIS of size lambda times lambda. And then we said that we can plug four elements, space the lambda over two, up to 256 elements, space the lambda over 16. So we expect no neutral coupling here and a lot of neutral coupling here. We have two color bars one in red or orange here, uh, which is when you optimize the system with our algorithms, but without taking into account the mutual coupling. And the blue one is when you take into account the mutual coupling. You can see that uh, when mutual coupling kicks in, but you don't take it into account, your performance degrades after a while. On the other end, if you always take it into account, you can get much better performance. And this through the algorithms that actually we, we developed. So to the best of my knowledge, this was the first time that uh, there was an algorithm that was uh, uh, aware of the mutual coupling between the elements that occurs by definition when you have a very, very dense deployment of, this, uh, of these elements, which is what people are trying to, are trying to do. Um, okay, I skip uh, a few slides in the interest of time. I give you first, I mean, uh, the, the papers where you can find um, uh, some of the results. This is where we introduce the model, uh, where we have basically all the theory behind, starting from Maxwell equations. And this is the, uh, where we describe the optimization problem that we, that we developed uh, for the special case that I told you. Here, the optimization problem was a little bit a toy because the system model was a single, uh, one transmitter, one receiver, only the, the RIS. Then uh, we generalized that recently. I'm just giving you the reference and I show you the, the results. Here we consider a MIMO interference channel. So this is a little bit more practical. Uh, um, this is still under review. But here we really modeled something of this kind. A bunch of transmitters, a bunch of receivers, pairs of transmitter receivers, they want to uh, talk to each other by using the same resources. So there, are inter there is interference in the network. And we want to optimize the jointly, the pre-coding of the transmitters, where now we can have MIMOS multiple antennas, and also how the impedances needs to be set in order to maximize your throughput, your rate. So the optimization problem, we write all the math, okay? And the optimization problems now looks like this. So we have a sum rate optimization problem, which we cannot solve uh, in closed form. And actually we cannot claim that the optimum is global because it's a it's no, no complex optimization problem. But um, we managed at least I mean, to develop an algorithm. So that, that just give you the results. Uh, the interesting part of these results is that uh, 
That's the sum rate and this with the iteration of the algorithm that we propose, which is an iterative algorithm. Uh, we have two set of lines, solid lines and dashed lines. Solid lines is a, do account for mutual coupling in the optimization process. Solid lines, you don't. When this, uh, the, the um, interdistance between the element is lambda over two, there is no difference between the, this, uh, the black lines. There is no difference. But when the uh, mutual coupling kicks in, you can see, for example, the purple line, you see that here you degrade a lot the performance as before. And the other end here, you increase and you get a much better rate. So here, uh, this is an example that shows you, if you take into account the mutual coupling, you can go from lambda over two to lambda over 16 spacing. You can pack many more elements in the same space without increasing the space, and you can get a much better, a much better rate while serving multiple users at the same, uh, at the same time. So this was the first time that, to the best of my knowledge, uh, this was done, at least, I mean, in this, uh, in this context. So exploiting the mutual coupling in structure that inherently are very densely deployed and where the mutual coupling cannot be ignored. Okay. So to close, uh, um, I try to introduce to you this concept of programming environment very quickly today. Um, and the idea is really to try to design a networks for which you don't have only active elements or elements that amplify and decode the signals, but actually you can deploy also elements like this RIS, uh, where you don't uh, use power amplifiers, you don't do any digital signal processing, but you try to do everything uh, as much as you can, at least uh, at what is called the layer zero, so at the electromagnetic level. And um, there is a huge interest now in this technology. There are many, many papers, I mean, uh, but honestly with you, I believe that the, the, the challenging problems need actually to be tackled. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, this was not possible is because we need to have also models that allows us, realistic models for these surfaces that allows us to, to go beyond, I mean, the, um, what we have been doing for a for, for long time now, with very simplistic models. So this reflection coefficient, which is a constant, uh, with a constant amplitude. Um, I think that there is, uh, at least, I mean, uh, there is a lot of synergies for uh, cross-disciplinary activities and research because, um, you know, uh, we have been always, we have been using always, I mean, uh, uh, models that are purely mathematical, but we have somehow forgot a lot of uh, electromagnetic things. So now there is a, a rethinking of that in wireless communication. So, you know, uh, if you look at the models that are used for MIMO, they are based on some assumptions. You are in the far field. The, the wave are pl uh, plane waves. But if you start having very large surfaces, for the reasons that I told you earlier, um, then you break this far field regime, the far field regime, and you may enter into near field regime where the waves are not anymore plane. Uh, I mean, you enter in a regime that has not been explored extensively, at least in wireless communications. And if you have sub wavelength elements in this RIS, you also have a mutual coupling that kicks in significantly. So there is a revival, if you want, on uh, revisiting uh, typical communication models by explicitly embedding into them electromagnetic aspects and circuit aspects, because also the circuit equivalent are very much used in the metamaterial and electromagnetic uh, community. And also, they simplify a lot, uh, in most cases, I mean, the analytical derivations and allows us to get uh, signals that look like the MIMOS, but with something more advanced, uh, I mean, uh, signal structure. So I close here. Uh, I just give you a reference, which I don't have time to, to discuss, but this is very, this is heavy electromagnetic. Maybe it's not that much of interest for um, uh, pure communication people, where we really, uh, you know, applied this, um, we departed from Maxwell equations in the vectorial form with all the, and we applied some scattering theories to characterize the uh, received power scattered by, by an RIS uh, by, by using some, so some models. So um, yes, as basically Francois was, was actually saying, there is a lot of interest in Europe. So we got uh, support from, from Europe uh, recently, uh, starting from November uh, 2019, uh, working on a bunch of projects uh, where this technology seems to be one of the enabling, uh, enabling, uh, enabling technologies, basically. So we are really working with many colleagues across multiple disciplines now to, to try to figure out a little bit what we're going to get. It can be of interest here to say that uh, in one of these projects, 5G, uh, RISE 6G, 
we will try uh, to deploy also uh, a test bed in, uh, in the train station in, in REN uh, with the help basically uh, of the um, sense F in order basically to try to figure out what the gains can be at least in this uh, in these settings and there are also some other industrial I mean scenarios that will be uh, evaluated so I guess that uh, I I stop uh, I stop here and um, sorry if I was five minutes late uh, I I thank I mean all of you for the nice uh, for the it was a pleasure, I mean, to be here. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, I would be really glad, I mean, to discuss with, uh, with you. So thank you very much. Okay, thanks, uh, Marco. Uh, any questions? Uh, I have a couple of questions. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the first one is very practical. I mean, uh, so um, what is the first the cost of this uh, beta material and what is the energy consumption? Uh, how does it cost to change the face? I mean, um, and a link to that, I mean, also, um, uh, I mean, uh, what are the infrastructure needed? You need very fast communication, right? to these meta surfaces to 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 reshape the reflection and and to in to to make everything in phase i mean uh, how practical is this in terms of uh, first i mean cost um uh, energy energy expenditure and uh, communication scheme in order to tune uh, real time the meta surface to this purpose i mean so uh, practical question yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, so let's let's say the, 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 that's a very good point. So, thank you for for these questions. And we are actually trying to find an answer to these questions. I would like to say that, uh, honestly speaking, um, you know, a general answer to this to these to these questions does not exist at the moment because we are trying to understand. But we we understand now the following at least. The first point is that how is the cost of each uh, of each uh, surface. The cost uh, now of each surface, I think it's, it's it's pretty high. So if you see some of the cost that some people who implement them mention in their papers, you can go to hundreds of uh, um, so of, of of dollars. Let's let's say if you see if you need to implement only one one piece of uh, of it, because it's uh, I mean you need to have many elements, uh, control circuits, etc. The point is that the people are discussing uh, at the when you reach the economy of scale. So basically, you, if you will be able to, to show that this technology is winning and then you try to build a very large number of uh, samples, then, I mean, you will reduce a lot of the, the cost. So for the time being, I mean, people are, um, are considering that. Each element, I mean, each scattering element can cost you a few cents if you go to the, to the economy of, uh, of scales. So that's that's the first point. But um, at the moment, I mean, it's pretty expensive. It's expensive to it's expensive, economically expensive, and it's also not trivial to design. <laughs> so it's uh, it's it's something not, okay. not trivial mm -hmm. at all. The other point is the power consumption. That's that's um, that's a good uh, that's a very good point, and the and the and the, and the answer that I can give you is that uh, we don't exactly know. Uh, power consumption model for an RIS. So this is something that we are trying to develop. In fact, mm -hmm. there is a lot of interest in uh, quantifying the energy efficiency of these surfaces, and we miss the power consumption model. The power consumption model that exists now says the following, which is what people are using. <laughs> it says that you have a... a, a a power consumption that uh, depends linearly on the number of elements that you that you activate but nobody knows how the power consumption depends on the on how you configure the phase mm -hmm. so when you exactly configure the phase or also when you can manipulate the amplitude this does not exist so one of the things that we are actually doing is using this um, this um, uh, the available prototypes in order to try to develop these models and then try to, to plug it in some optimization uh, frameworks. Mm. So this, this is one of the, I have to say that this is one of the objective of this, um, of this project, of this project, uh, of this project.
projects here. So I asked this to two or three colleagues and they told me we don't have it, we don't have these models, we need to develop them. So uh, it's, a very, it's a very good point and uh, yeah, unfortunately still, still waiting for, for those things. And then I mean, how fast you said, how fast? Yeah, this, this I mean, the, these prototypes have shown that if you deploy them in, a, um, okay, there are two approaches here, at least. If you deploy it in an in in indoor environment, uh, people have shown that uh, you can actually re re readapt with conventional hardware the, the, the with, with the hardware that you can buy to the to the mobility I mean of of users. So typical mobi indoor mobility you can track the coherence uh, the coherence uh, coherence time. I've seen experiments, and this I mean can be done. What is a little bit more challenging to do, uh, but I mean you, you need to understand whether you want to adapt these surfaces to the fast fading or to the long-term statistics. Mm. So all the, the vast majority of papers available today assume that you want to get the optimum and so you optimize it to instantaneous channel state information. This is considered to be, uh, of course, impractical. Also because the prototypes that we have, uh, the meta surfaces, do not necessarily allow you to do that. First. And, uh, and the second thing is that now there is a lot of interest in developing uh, optimization frameworks relying on um, statistical CSI. So rather than changing it to the short-term statistics, but to, to the covariance matrix. Mm. So now, I mean, there are some results that have shown that, uh, okay, you lose something, but you still gain a lot uh, with respect to not deploying this, uh, these surfaces. This is much more, uh, this will make things much more, uh, much more uh, practical, let's say, than, uh, than assuming that you can do whatever you want and um, uh, at zero delay, let's say. Mm. We, uh, I have to be honest, we did some studies and if you account for the overhead that you need for channel estimation, you see that there is a crossing point that tells you if you have uh, too many elements. So if you need to reconfigure too many elements, at a given point, the overhead for channel estimation kills you. And the prelog factor in your capacity basically uh, gives you that the capacity drops down. Mm. So uh, you need to take into account the variability of the channels, but also you, you cannot have an, inf an arbitrary number of elements that you can do whatever you want because this will kill your, uh, your performance in terms of time and in terms of power consumption, as you, as you said. I didn't discuss this today, but we do have some, um, but I, I would like to, to clarify. Uh, these are based on uh, theoretical models, okay, for the power consumption, because we don't have it. In order to get concrete numbers, we should plug what I told you before, which we don't have at the moment. Hmm. I'm not sure if this answers more or less the... Uh, I'm, Yes, I'm it does. Uh, yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry when, when people, because I mean, uh, many of the questions that most of the time that people ask me, the thing is that we don't have the, we don't have the answer at the moment. <laughs> but, yeah, so that's, I try to elaborate a lot. <laughs> it's a sign. Of, it's a sign of uh, research, right? It's a proof of <laughs> yes, yes. doing research. Yeah. I, I have another question, if you allow me, which is yeah, more yeah. a math question. I mean, you alluded to the connection with the relay channel, uh, but is there? Um, uh, RIS channel, does it make sense? And does one know the capacity? Uh, so it seems to be a relay channel with constraints, right? That you, if you, if you take, for instance, only, only the, uh, the said phase, phase, phase chant, right? So yeah. you, you, I mean, uh, and so there is this uh, huge work by David Che and Abbas El Gamal on the relay channel. So how does it fit and uh, with this mass corpus? Yeah. <clears throat> yes, yes, yeah. That's a that's a very good uh, that's a very good point. So, at, 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 let's say a truly information theoretic formulation of the RIS used as a, as a relay channel. So, the transmitter is here. The, the surface is very far from the transmitter, and then the receiver is also far from both of them. A truly information theoretic formulation, to the best of my knowledge, for the relay channel does not really. I haven't seen it. Let's say. But mm -hmm. what we actually have, I developed this with some, uh, with some colleagues. We have uh, another settings where you have uh, the, okay, let's, let's say this, 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 can be, this can be, let's say, also viewed as a relay channel, but let's say the, the practical case is that you have the transmitter, you have the surface, and then you assume that you have a link that allows you to control the surface directly from the transmitter. So if you have this information theoretic uh, model, 
the transmitter that is physically connected through the through the RIS through a cable, for example, so in a transmitter mode, and then you have the receiver that is far. In that case, we have a, um, we actually computed the the actual capacity of this uh, of mm. this system model. We have a paper on that, and and we have shown that uh, the using the RIS only for reflection its capacity is suboptimal. What you need to do is also to encode the information onto the onto the states of the of the RIS. For this, I do have uh, I do have results that I can uh, that I can send you, uh, and um, and we have actually shown that there are uh, that in this case the, the information theoretic model can be we can actually de de develop it, but under one assumption that uh, is, is the original model that I told you. So the the, the the amplitude of the reflection coefficient is one, and you can tune only the phase. So the phase mm. matrix is a, is, a, is a diagonal matrix with ideal uh, with ideal phase shift. The only thing that we add is that the phase shift are not a continuum, but they belong to a discrete alphabet. So we have a discrete alphabet for the phases that you can change, and a discrete alphabet for the um, for the input signal. Mm. That's that's basically for this we do have the for this we do have the the, the results. The 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 uh, Shannon Shannon. Uh, yeah, yeah, the Shannon. Yeah, I can uh, I can show. You. Okay. Oh, great. I can, Thank I can you. show you. I can show you the paper for this. We have actually yes. the, Shannon, the Shannon capacity. Yeah. 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 Please send. Yes. But Thank it's a, is a is a generalization of some info, mutual information that you can find in uh, Cover and Thomas uh, paper. But I will I will send you. Yeah, I will send you. Th thanks a lot. Other question? I have a question. Uh, thanks, Mark, for the for the presentation. It was very very interesting. Uh, and uh, I was wondering, uh, in in your modeling, are you considering that the multiple paths are uh, separable in time at the receiver or uh, not separable in time? Ah, very good point. Very good. Point. Because I've seen that there are two kind of models. Um, most of the time, the people consider them non-separable, but make more complex also the optimization because variables are then uh, uh, correlated. And then there is the separable models that is a little bit more simpler to, to, to optimize. Yeah, yeah. In this, uh, in, yeah, that's a very good point. So in the, so you are basically considering that you have this sort of reflections from each of the element that you also take into account the time, the time component. So you can have yeah. this. So you have the direct path and the reflected path and the, the reflected path and the, and the direct path can be, um, the, the sample ah. can be separated over time. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or so, they are arrived or they are not separable over time. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the okay, no, okay. So I was I was thinking that you were uh, talking about the delays of each scattered um, path from. No, the, that, that would be much more complex. I yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, I was thinking about that, and in fact, I was trying to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the the the, 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 the analysis of the direct uh, path plus the scattered uh, path. This actually, this actually, uh, ex uh, this actually exists. So you can uh, most of the most of the people, I mean, uh, tend to ignore the direct path because they say that the RIS makes sense when this is the case. But there are actually studies also on the on accounting for the uh, for the direct for the direct path. But at the moment, basically, they are considered to be to be separable. Yes. Okay. Because so, you are. I mean, honestly, basically, we didn't really spend too much time on, on looking at the what happens over time. Yes, I've seen a couple of papers now that they are trying to take this into account. Uh, I kind of okay. to, in the model that I've been considering so far, uh, we considered them just uh, just a sum, basically, in the complex domain. Yeah. Okay. So you can actually access them in a separa separately, uh, if, if I understand basically your uh, okay. question. Or you were, uh, just something to understand, you have a S uh, T minus T1 plus S T minus T2. Is this what you were uh, talking Yes, about? Uh, exactly. Well, I think that... Uh... Uh, 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 we only have a phase, no, in the, also in the model that I, that I developed, which is electromagnetic, 
Uh, you just consider a phase shift. You just consider a phase shift. No, we don't consider that. No. But, and then you always consider separable. So it's a it's an assumption that is quite uh, okay. Uh, yeah, thanks, this is thanks, this is the case that that we have only the separable uh, case. We don't consider the insapar uh, the overlapping multipath components. Yeah. yeah. No, no, but th thank you very much because I haven't uh, uh, seen much about about this, and, uh, and and I was wondering indeed if it was just because lack of time in searching. But, but no, 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 no. I, we, we are really starting from the very simple toy case studies. Also, all the models that I told you, uh, the physics one, physics inspired one, are uh, only valid for the free space. We don't even have a fading now okay. in the model that I that I showed you. And maybe if I can another question, maybe more more, more general. And I was wondering regarding the the since this uh, you are changing the, the the propagation and also the received power. Do you think that uh, this will have an effect on the regulation on the uh, on the emitted energy? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a very good point. So um, yeah, so we are actually trying to now. I mean, I don't. So let's put it this way. Uh, yes, we are trying to study this. So depending on how you optimize these uh, weights or, or of the or basically the response, let's say uh, the scattering uh, response of these uh, surfaces, and also how you optimize the weights uh, of the transmitter and the receiver, you are gonna really change uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the the level of electromagnetic radiations at different at different points. But also, I mean, you have effect affect also the electromagnetic field exposure of the people who are in the nearby nearby uh, area. Exactly. So uh, we are actually we are actually studying this in the sense that there is a lot of interest from some some companies in order to use these surfaces to, to understand the two things. When you want to maximize the received signal at some point, but by keeping the limit. Okay. Uh, another operation is when you are trying to create energy nulls. For example, you may want to have in some areas, there might be people all day long there, and you may want to reduce the electromagnetic radiation as you, as you want for a given amount of time. So this is something that we are trying to, to, to develop. Uh, and um, there were also some research activities uh, on, uh, on that, uh, and we are trying to, to, to depart basically from, the, from that. There was a project called the LexNet, I guess, FlexNet, I don't remember, LexNet, I guess, on this uh, characterizing the electromagnetic exposure to human beings, and, uh, and we are actually working on that. So we, what we are able to prove, what we were able to show recently, but the paper is not out yet, uh, we are uh, working on the writing, is that by using these surfaces, you may, you may actually be able to get this, um, to, 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 to reduce basically the electromagnetic exposure while at the same time guaranteeing the same uh, transmission rate. By electromagnetic exposure, I mean the near field effect, uh, for example, when you have a, a, a transmitter, a mobile phone that is close to your head. Okay. This very low, but you can still achieve the same, the same, the same uh, capacity thanks to the the RIS. This only for the receiver, not for this is uh, so, yeah. So for the time being, are... there is yeah. For for the time being, the results that we have is that uh, you have a transmitter or or a receiver that are close to the human being, and an RIS that is uh, that is far. And you can reduce the electromagnetic field in the neighborhood of the of the person, but That's you don't good. touch anything about the RIS. The second step is to see uh, how the level of electromagnetic radiation changes over uh, over space in the presence of the RIS. And there are some uh, metrics that allows us to do to do to do that. Uh, the optimization problem is a little bit different because we started writing the optimization problems, but with the first problem we solve it. The second problem, uh, we, we have not tackled it, uh, tackled it yet. Uh, but there is one paper from a colleague, that a short paper that tried to do that all, uh, already for a uh, uplink multi-user uh, MIMO channel. But it's a very good point because many people ask, yeah, that's a, very good, uh, that's a very good point, especially because the surfaces are very large and we may have a very sharp beams and uh, this needs to be carefully studied. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, thanks. No, I think time is running. <laughs>
So we may close uh, the, the, the discussion here. And uh, of course, uh, if some people have some contact, some uh, question to, to ask uh, to, to, to Marco, Mirenzo, uh, they can send a mail. Okay, thanks, uh, Marco, for this presentation. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Yeah. See you soon then. Bye. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much. Goodbye.